So, so basically, uh, Vinny is like a co-organizer of the, the machine learning meetup. He has already done a talk uh, last year. Uh, I think it was the last physical meetup, actually, uh, in January last year before COVID in, uh, in Credit Suisse office uh, with lots of attendance and pizzas. Uh, since then, uh, the format, as you saw, has changed and uh, etc. But we still continue. So uh, Vinny is uh, actually a PhD student uh, at HKUST with Professor uh, Daniel Palomar, which is an expert in like optimization, convex optimization. I, uh, I actually uh, met uh, Professor Palomar back in 2016 at a conference in Shanghai, where I was like uh, presenting tutorials on uh, optimization for um, for telco and uh, portfolio constructions, actually one of his students. So, so he has also a few papers on doing mean reverting baskets, etc. And uh, Vinin during his PhD is investigating the use of optimization to uh, to learn uh, networks in finance, or at least that's the the talk he will do. So this field is like uh, developing for the past twenty years, building networks in finance. Uh, I have actually a review paper on the topic. So most of the time, either the graph is given and you pay a couple of hundred bucks to, um, to buy it from a data vendor or you build it yourself from uh, some signal. And I guess that's, uh, that's what Vinny will present. So a new method uh, that, that can estimate hidden networks in, uh, in, uh, between financial assets. And, and uh, also, I myself not a super expert in, in optimization, but uh, I brought with me uh, my uh, expert optimizer. So if there are like technicalities, he, he will be able to jump in to, uh, to highlight, uh, highlight uh, stuff. It's, uh, it's uh, all yours now. Very nice. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Gutierre, for, uh, for the nice introduction. And, and remembering that uh, the last time I um, the last time we met physically, right, was during the meetup uh, last year in January. And uh, well, one year later, here am I again uh, with now a, a topic of my own, I would say. Before it was, uh, it was uh, uh, I was talking about risk parity and it was, uh, it was already, the work was already done, let's say. Um, I was just um, showcasing a, a software. Uh, whereas today um, I'm very happy to, to to talk a little bit about my, not 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 just my own work, my my work with my collaborators, uh, Jashi and uh, and Professor Daniel. So um, the title of my talk is "Learning Graphs in Financial Markets," and um, these are these are the photos of uh, my handsome collaborators, Jashi and, and Professor Daniel. And this talk is based on this paper, um, which uh, uh, whose title is called. Uh, Algorithms for learning graphs in financial markets, and so if you if you notice, I, I removed the I removed the name algorithms from this talk because I'm not gonna dive into the into the algorithm design of, of the estimators here. Um, I will I will try to be um, as high level as high level as possible. And uh, from from this uh, from this archive uh, screenshot here, you can see that I submitted the paper on on December thirty first, twenty twenty. It was kind of on purpose because I wanted to like, um, well, 2020 was been a was was an was a hectic hectic year for everybody, right? And I, I wanted to wrap it up uh, with all my pending things, let's say. So I, I made sure that the paper got submitted uh, before before 2021st. Okay, without further ado, uh, um, let me start. These are, these are the contents of my talk. I'm gonna. I'm going to start giving an introduction and a little bit of background in financial data and, and graphs and, and what it means to learn graphs from data. Then I'm going to move on on, on our main research contributions. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to focus in particular in particular in one of them, uh, which is um, a student key formulation for, for the graph learning problem. And then I'm going to show some experiments with public data that everybody can reproduce. Uh, using using data from the U.S. stock market and from foreign exchanges, and then finally some conclusions. So um, this this talk is going to revolve around this uh, fluxogram here, uh, where 
where uh, I'm going to start in on this block here on the financial data block, um, where I'm going to talk and discuss a little bit about some characteristics of financial data, the so-called like stylized facts. And then um, I'm going to try to make a link uh, between financial data and graphs and uh, why graphs is a, why graphs are, are a good models, let's say for, for financial data. And hopefully I'll, by the end of this talk, you'll be convinced that graphs are, 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 um, are indeed a good model for, for this type of data. And then I'm gonna discuss very briefly um, the, the inference that we perform, which is via, via optimization techniques to, to extract right information from, from the models. And then I'm gonna draw some criticisms um, uh, towards uh, some state-of-the-art models, right? And then we are gonna improve on them um, and then maybe we go back to the data and look at the data again and, and try to improve things. And, and um, yeah, I think my, my research um, in this paper has, um, has been following this, this fluxogram very well. So I really like it. Um, so let's start with financial data. So basically um, in many machine learning tasks, the data can be represented as a matrix. Well, sometimes you cannot store the whole matrix in, in the memory, but uh, let's put that aside for a second. Um, in finance, uh, we like to represent the data as a matrix X, which is a N by P matrix, where N is the number of observations, like the number of timestamps that you, that you have the price for a given stock or for a given um, financial instrument. And P is the number of financial instruments or assets and, and so on. So in, in real life, we often plot the columns of that matrix, right? In a, in, we overplot all, the, all those columns. And then we see the time series is what we see. What we are seeing here in this, in this um, picture is actually time series of log returns of many stocks. And for those of you who, who are not familiar with uh, financial data, log returns are basically an approximation to the relative change of price. Of, of my stock, for example. And so here is how they, they um, how those time series, how they look like. And it's, it's interesting that we can see that this mess here between March and April of last year was actually, uh, was actually caused by, by the pandemic that we are currently um, going through. And it's, it's very evident, right? From, from the rest of the time series, we can, we can um, easily eyeball that that something was going on there, um, but many of the times it's not easy to it's not easy to eyeball anything, and it would be nice if we could have a, a, a model that tells us like, hey, there might be something uh, weird going on there on those um, financial instruments. Maybe it's worth investigating, or maybe it's not. Maybe uh, the model failed and and, and everything collapsed. <laughs> um, so. Um, there are some um, some uh, stylized facts um, about about those time series, is right? Some intrinsic um, intrinsic phenomena that uh, people have been studying all over um, all over the years. I mean, it's been maybe twenty years that people know about these things. Um, um, when one of them is that the correlations between uh, financial instruments, especially stocks, they are very often uh, observed to be positive, right? And here I've, I've, um, I've listed two papers that um, take advantage of this fact, right? One by um, by Yu Hao, which is uh, which is attending uh, which is attending the meetup tonight and just gave a talk, and the other one by Agra Hao, which uh, who is a PhD student at MIT, if I'm not uh, if I'm not mistaken. And you can see that those papers are very recent. Um, it, that's not a coincidence. It's because uh, these these topics nowadays have been uh, have been very hot. I mean, if you follow the archive every day, uh, papers and papers coming out on these um, on these topics of, of like trying to understand um, correlation matrices of, of a specific type of data or with a specific structure. Um, and that's that's one thing about financial data. Those correlations are often positive. And um, just not to take it for granted for, from those papers, I decided to do an experiment myself and, and see uh, whether, you know, uh, just to verify things. And then I, I um, download some data from Yahoo Finance and compute the, um, compute the sample correlation matrix of, of those um, log returns of many stocks and 
draw the histogram of those correlation coefficients and indeed I could verify that yeah okay most of the things are are positive here um, and um, yeah I tried with different time horizons and different number of stocks and more or less the thing that I observed is, is more or less uh, more or less this shape or, or like um, everything more or less positive so it makes sense um, the other the other stylized fact which uh, <clears throat> has not been uh, very much explored, I would say, in the literature, especially in the, when it involves uh, estimation of networks of, of assets, is the fact that financial data is, is heavy detailed, right? In fact, uh, um, most of the works, they completely ignore, ignore this. I mean, most of them rely on the fact that, uh, on the assumption that, uh, no, the data is Gaussian, so everything is, is um, beautiful and, uh, and and everything works well, the math is well understood, and we don't have to do anything crazy. But um, the, uh, the reality is a bit different. Uh, the reality is that financial data, especially stocks, they are very, um, they contain many outliers and they are super heavy detailed. Um, so to verify that again, in practice, I did this little experiment where I computed the histogram of, of log returns here of different stocks or, or maybe this was the uh, this was the sp500 index and um i fit a gaussian i fit a one dimensional gaussian to this um, empirical distribution and we can observe that while around the mean here of the empirical distribution the fit is is well um the curve the gaussian fits fits the empirical distribution well over the tails it, the the story is completely different um basically uh Basically, if, if we build a model, um, assuming that the data follows a Gaussian statistics, the Gaussian is basically telling us, hey, around, around here, around those values here, uh, minus uh, after, uh, I don't know, minus 0.01, uh, forget about it. Everything has probability zero to happen, right? However, in practice, it's, it's much different, right? In practice, we can see that there is a there is clearly a non-zero probability of of these these uh, outliers or or these tail event, events happening. Um, so, so whatever model you built based on a Gaussian is going to um, is going to in the best case completely ignore um, these these events. And then in finance, it's often it's often the story where where those events those outlier events are the ones that we are most interested in right they are either the ones that we make money or the ones that we lose money so um, um, it's a bit surprising to me that that uh, not many people have considered um, heavy tails on on for example estimating networks of, of stocks now the third uh, fact that I would like to that I would like to express here is the is the stylized fact that says that uh, stock markets in particular, right? They are very modular, and um, this this stylized fact has been um, has been explored, especially uh, by Marco Marco Lopez de Prado on his uh, on his hierarchical um, risk parity portfolio technique. Uh, if you are familiar with that technique, uh, basically he starts by creating um, creating a, a, a tree graph, right? A hierarchical model of the stocks. And a tree, a tree is, 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 um, is the most sparse, sparse connected graph that, that one can get, right? So it makes sense that the tree is gonna be a, a modular, it's gonna have a modular structure by construction. So he tries to, the, the hierarchical risk parity portfolio tries to take advantage of that modularity um, while while allocating the risk of of the of each financial instrument, so this has been explored as well, and it's very it's very important to take into account this um, this fact when when especially when we evaluate the results of our models, right? Meaning that if if we estimate a graph and the graph doesn't look modular or or the modularity index of the graph is small, then there's probably some, some, we are probably doing something wrong. So here, for example, it's a, it's a network of stocks from the SP500, uh, four sectors uh, from this paper. And um, 
we can see that there is a clear um, there is a clear modular um, structure in this in this graph, right? And and uh, each color here represents one sector, and uh, these sectors they are often given by by these um, by by these classification standards, right? Such as geeks, and so. Uh, but uh, we need to we need to be a, a little bit careful. We need to take this um, this sector classification systems with a grain of salt because, especially nowadays, um, companies, especially let's say tech companies such as Google, um, Amazon, Facebook, they are very diverse, right? They they um, for example, Google. If I'm not mistaken, Google is listed as a um, communication services company um, as per the Geeks um, classification system. However, one might as well say that Google has a huge impact, for example, on um, say on the information technology sector, or or on on pretty much any other sector nowadays. Like for companies um, of this um, of this magnitude, Google, Amazon, they we know that they impact many sectors. Not only not only the sector that they belong to, according to those those classification systems. So we need to be um, we need to be a little bit careful. For example, if you want to design a, a portfolio and you want to diversify the portfolio across like different sectors, then um, you might as well like it would be helpful to have some information on whether um, whether that stock is actually correlated with the stocks within the sector that that those classification systems um, say. Right. So. Um, Okay, now we've we've discussed a little bit about financial data. Um, now let's let's move on to to graphs. So uh, first of all, uh, what's a graph, right? So mathematically, um, we can express um, we can express a graph in many ways. The way I the way I, I do it here is um, as a triple a V, E, and a W, right? This to represent an undirected weighted graph. V is the set of nodes. E is a subset. Of all possible sets containing um, containing uh, pairs U and V uh, that belong to belong to calligraphical V here, such that U is different than V, and uh, these two these two these two quantities these two entities here V and E they can be um, they can be encoded let's say in a in a matrix called the adjacency matrix, which is um which is a uh, um, um, a non a non uh, non negative matrix right p by p uh, and it's it's um, it's symmetric because we are considering uh, undirected graphs and um, the, the diagonal we assume that the, the diagonal of this matrix is um, is zero because there is no no loops in the graph pretty much and um, so so basically this adjacency matrix if we if we have an entry that is there is um, there is positive for for example in this adjacency matrix it means that there is a connection between those two nodes between the row and the column um, in that entry um, and and the the amount of the connection let's say the strength of the connection is is on the is on the magnitude of, of that number right of the number in that um, in that particular uh, coordinate of the matrix, and two two other um, important quantities for graphs are Laplace the Laplacian matrix, which is computed uh, like this, and the degree vector, which is the diagonal of the Laplacian matrix. I'm gonna be talking about the Laplacian matrix um, a little bit later on in the talk, uh, but the degree vector for a weighted graph pretty much quantifies the strength of each node. Let's say, um, and we will see that it's important to to control this guy when we are estimating when we are estimating graphs, and we, we will see why. Um, so here is a picture of a graph, um, a weighted graph. So this um, the squares represent the nodes, and the links between um, between the squares represent the edges, and these the numbers here are, are the symbols W um, sub a number represents the the weight between. Um, the weight in each edge or, or the weight between each node, right? Um, so graphs have found application in many fields. I mean, it's, um, we can spend the whole night here talking about applications of, of graphs in clustering community detection and also in, in very complicated networks such as um, social and biological networks. 
Um, and also in applied finance, which is the field that I'm um, that I'm interested in, and graphs have, have been applied, for example, to identify business as usual or crash periods, or to like construct networks of companies or to understand the risk um, associated with a portfolio, right? Like the um, like the um, hierarchical risk parity by Lopez de Prado, and um, for all these techniques that I listed above, the learning the graph is a key enabling step, right? You need to first, before doing anything else, you need to estimate the graph in a, in a sound, convincing way, right? But uh, despite these, uh, these uh, myriad of applications of graphs, um, um, learning graphs from data is actually a very hot topic as, as, I, was, uh, as I was saying before, like the number of papers in the archive are, are just um, exploding <laughs> recently, um, which is good. Um, and yeah, so, um, okay, I've, I've talked about graphs and, and about data, but um, let's try to make the link, right, between the financial data and, and graphs. How can we imagine like linking these two um, seemingly um, uh, disparate things? Um, so here is, a, here is how we would uh, go, for example, to try to model uh, a network of stocks, a network of stocks, for example, uh, with a graph, right? This figure here represents um, represents a graph, right? The, 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 this structure here that I've shown before. And the, the vertical bars here represent would represent, for example, the price of a stock. And then the node, each node of the graph would represent a stock, and then the edges between the graphs would represent some measure of correlation or, or some measure of dependency uh, between these two, these two stocks or these two financial instruments. So the, 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 the goal here is to estimate the, the graph structure based on those measurements that we can, we can observe um, at each node, right, over time. So how, how, do we, how do we actually do that, right? How do we find, for example, a graph that best, quote unquote, best fits the data. And now I'm gonna define uh, what best mean uh, in, in just a second. And now, now uh, following following uh, my fluxogram here, let's uh, let's move on to the inference, to the inference part. And um, in order to do inference, we first have to we first have to assume a statistical model, right, for for our data. And as I was saying before, it's, it's very common to assume that the, the data, um, the financial data that you have, for example, the log returns, they, that they are Gaussian. Uh, in this case, I'm going to assume that uh, they are indeed Gaussian with zero mean. And, um, and uh, the covariance matrix of this uh, multivariate Gaussian is gonna be, um, is gonna be modeled as a, as an inverse inverse Laplace matrix, uh, this this uh, symbol here is to denote the pseudo inverse because we're going to see that the Laplace matrix is actually uh, singular. So um, and and yeah, so the Laplace matrix has has these two um, key properties here. Um, the the um, let's let's first talk about the second property. As funny as it sounds. Um, the second property says that the um, the off-diagonal elements of the Laplace matrix they are they are um, they are non-positive. Uh, that implies that the conditional correlations between the nodes in in the graph they are positive, which is actually one stylized fact that we've seen before. And then the first property here uh, is a bit obscure, but we are going to understand it uh, in just a second. But, but basically, it says that the sum of the rows or the columns of the Laplace matrix has to be zero, and um, this this uh, this immediately implies that um, that the Laplace matrix is singular, and that um, the eigenvector associated with uh, with the zero eigenvalue is is uh, is aligned with the all one vector, and we will see we will see. Um, this sounds a bit like artificial, but we will see that that's actually the case in finance data. So to actually see that, um, I performed an experiment, right, with around four, a little bit more than 400 stocks from the SP500 from 2005 to 2020, around uh, almost 4,000 observations. 
And then I divide this, this data set in many chunks, many overlapping chunks, and I compute the sum of precision matrix uh, of those, of those um, overlapping chunks of data. And then what I see, what I observe um, on the condition number, um, sorry, uh, what I observe on the condition number of those matrices is that uh, it's very large, which means that um, which means that the matrix is uh, nearly singular. So it's um, it's it's um, aligned with the fact that um, our Laplacian matrix is is, is singular, right? And um, um, on top of that, we also observe that the average variance of the eigenvector associated with the zero eigenvalue is very small. And that, that means that the, this eigenvector is approximately constant when compared to, to the other eigenvectors, right? And which is the case of the, uh, of the Laplacian matrix, the, the, the eigenvalue associated with the zero eigenvector is completely constant, right? In our case, in the, in the real data case, of course, it's not, it's not completely constant, but it's, we could say nearly, nearly constant. So I think we are convinced that the Laplacian matrix um, can actually be a good model for, for the precision matrix of, of financial instruments. So um, now let's move on to, to some optimization formulations uh, that have been used, for example, in by state-of-the-art algorithms. And, and uh, we will also discuss what I've done um, in that paper, a, a little bit of what I've done in that paper. Yeah. So, um, um, I would say that this, this, this optimization problem that we are seeing here, um, that I'm showing here, is probably, is probably like um, one, of the first, uh, one of the first models to estimate a, a Laplacian matrix, right? This, was, um, this problem was posed back in uh, 2019, not too long ago, actually 2017, sorry, not too long ago, four years ago, uh, in, this, in this particular form, right? Um, and if we if we look at it uh, closely, these first two terms they account for the for the likelihood of the likelihood of the um, of our Gaussian model, right? And then it's very often um, very often it's common to add a regularization function to to whatever model we are estimating. We try to regularize it somehow in order to keep things um, let's say under under some bounds or or, um, or something, right? And uh, it's very common to add, for example, the L1 norm of the, the entry-wise L1 norm of, of, of a precision matrix, for example. If you are familiar with the, uh, for example, with the graphical lasso problem, you will see that this is nothing but, but the graphical lasso problem with additional Laplacian constraints, right? With these additional uh, two linear constraints. So this problem, um, it's, it's a convex problem. And if you are not familiar with, uh, with convex optimization, uh, don't worry about it. Basically, loosely speaking, um, a convex problem is just a problem that let's, let's put it that we can solve it in, in polynomial time. Um, but again, um, depending, on, uh, depending on the dimension of, of the problem that you want to solve, even though it's convex, it may not be suitable to be solved by, by convex programming languages, for example, such as um, CVXPy. And then there is the need to design um, ad hoc algorithms um, to actually solve this problem in like a scalable fashion, so that we can we can run um, we can estimate those matrices like with a thousand nodes or or over thousand over a thousand nodes. Before with CVX, if you try to solve this problem in a personal computer, for example. Um, Depending on the configurations, you cannot do more than more than fifty, more than fifty nodes. For example, you cannot have more than fifty stocks in your network um, if you want to do it in your laptop, say. And uh, another interesting thing that I like to point out in this problem, just so you know how um, how this field is still uh, is still let's say maturing, is that this was very common to add this L1 norm here. It's very, it's, it's almost a no-brainer, right? Okay, put the L1 norm there. We're gonna get a sparse. Uh, we're gonna get a sparse model at the end. The story is completely the opposite. Um, my friend Ing um, has shown um, has showed this uh, last year at New Rips that um, if you add the L1 norm to this problem, you are actually gonna get 
you are actually going to get a dense model as 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 alpha increases. It's totally uh, counterintuitive, but uh, but um, we actually proved that that that's actually the case. So um, the Laplace matrix also, um, apart from those properties that I discussed it before, it has a very interesting property, which is that if you can control the rank of of the of the matrix you can control exactly the number of components of the graph. So imagine you have a big graph and you want, you want to split that graph in say K graphs. So the way, one way to do it is to actually, to actually impose this type of constraint here, the rank, uh, rank constraints um, on the Laplace matrix. But the problem, the problem with this, um, the problem with this constraint is that it's it's hugely non-convex. I, I mean, it's it's a very scary, let's say, constraint because it's non-convex, non-differentiable. It's non-everything, so uh, it's not very easy to deal with it directly. Um, so um, more often than not, uh, people resort to approximations of the rate constraint and so on. Uh, but I'm not I'm not gonna dive into this uh, into these uh, mathematical details here. So uh, we've seen a little bit of um, the optimization problems that people have considered in, in the literature. And now let's see how, how do they perform in practice and let's see whether we can draw any uh, criticism towards the estimated models and then possibly we can improve on those models. So uh, to draw some criticisms in, in machine learning is often the case where you have an objective measure, right? accuracy, for example, or recall or F measure and so on and so forth. Um, in our case here, we're gonna be using two, two measures uh, to, per, to, to quantify the performance of a, of a network estimation method, let's say. Um, the, first, the, first, um, the first measure is gonna be a subjective. It's, it's gonna be a bit subjective. It's going to be like how, how good the graph actually looks, right? Is it does it make sense? Like if I show this to a to a, to a portfolio manager or to or to a person working in finance, do they do they believe that that network comes from a comes from a a, a set of financial instruments or not? And the other quantity is actually a, a objective quantity. It's called the modularity index. And by the name, you can already have a, a good idea of what it means. It means how much modular the graph is, right? We would expect financial graphs to be very modular just because of the nature of the nature of, of the data, the nature of the hierarchy of, of the stocks or the financial instruments. So we're gonna be using this to evaluate. So, um, so in these plots that, that you see here is from um, experiments that I did. I'm gonna talk about the details of the data and and, uh, and the time horizon a little bit later. Um, using these two, using these two estimation models, the one from Zhao and the one from Kumar. So the first one is to estimate a connected graph, right? And each each color here is also a sector of of the SP five hundred. And we can we can see we can tell that there is some structure there, but we can also tell that the graph is very messy in the sense that there are way too many connections. Possibly, it's hard to to um, to understand what's what's possibly going on there. But we, yeah, we can clearly see that there is some uh, some structure, some modularity there. Um, the other one is from uh, is a k component uh, is a k component estimation algorithm. Um, but in this case, it um, it fails. It, actually, this algorithm it fails to to return a, a meaningful k-component graph. And and um, the problem with this algorithm is that th uh, they do not control the degree of the nodes, right? While while performing the optimization, they they try to impose the rank constraints, but um, there is a, there is a lack of of control of the degrees of the nodes. And what happens here is that we can see there is a huge chunk of the graph which is connected and three isolated nodes, right? It was supposed to, to be like four, a four component graph with four sectors. Each color again is a, it's a representative sector. So it was supposed to be a, a nice um, four component graph, but it's actually 
a, 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 it's still a four component graph, but with one huge component and three isolated nodes, which is not what we, what we would like to have in practice. So yeah, after, after having drawn some criticisms on those models, let's see how, how we can, uh, how we can actually improve, right? Um, and, and then now I'm going to discuss a few of our, a few of our contributions, which are, um, which are much better described possibly on, uh, on our archive paper. So uh, we begin by, by um, we begin by, by assuming that the data is actually, actually follows a heavy tail distribution. In this case, we chose the, um, the student T distribution and this is the PDF of the student T um, distribution. This, this, the determinant here with the, the star here is because um, as you know, the Laplacian matrix is, is singular, so we cannot actually say compute the determinant per se. And then this, this um, entity here is called the Schudo determinant, which is pretty much uh, the product of the positive eigenvalues of, of the matrix L, right? And the rest is the, the well-known um, student T PDF. So if we, if we work out the maths and we, we can formulate the, the maximum likelihood estimator, as this, as this, um, as this, um, as this optimization problem here, which is is possibly non-convex, right? We have a concave term here, the log minus log the determinant. It's it's actually convex, but we have this concave component here, so we cannot. Um, it's it's quite likely to be um, in general. It's going to be non-convex. And then now we also introduce uh, a constraint, a linear constraint on the degrees of the of the, of, of, of the nodes, right? Because as we saw, we don't want to, we don't want to repeat the same mistake of that algorithm before, where when they try to estimate um, a k component graph, there there were actually um, isolated nodes there, and we don't we want to avoid that. And for for um, k component graphs, we have the additional rank constraint here. Which again, I'm not going to go into the details on how like we approximate this constraint and, and put it into the objective function and so on. If you if you want to um, know the details, it's it's um, all well well described in the paper. Or feel free to ask me um, or send me an email. Um, yeah, I'm happy to discuss uh, these details more. Also, and so, uh, but I, I would like to I would like to just. Um, we spend 10 seconds talking about how we actually go about uh, designing an algorithm for these problems, right? Here, I cannot even use CVX, right? Because it's non-convex, so I cannot even try with a small network, right? I have to design, um, I have to design an algorithm to actually find a stationary point of these, uh, of these optimization problems. And um, the main algorithm that um, we used in, in, in our paper, um, was the ADMM algorithm. And um, I'm gonna just spend 20 seconds really quickly just talking about what is ADMM, just so uh, you are not left uh, without anything about, about how we actually solve these problems. So let's just, um, yeah, the last semester here in, in UST, I gave, a, I gave a mini lecture about um, ADMM, right, in the convex optimization course uh, that my advisor actually uh, teaches this course for like, um, I'm not going to say the number of years because then uh, then I'm going to be revealing his age and he's going to be upset with me. So, but he, he's been teaching this course for for uh, a few years, let's say. Um, so basically, uh, let's say we want to solve this this type of problem, this type of optimization problem here, where x and z are um, our, our optimization variables and f and g are object our functions in the objective. Right, we want to minimize the summation subject to these constraints and so on. So what what um, what ADMM does uh, in ADMM stands for the alternating direction method of multipliers. Basically, you construct a quantity called the Lagrangian, which can be constructed like this, and then you use the augmented Lagrangian method. You you just um, kind of relax the constraints that you had. Um, and you add this um, Frobenius norm term here. And then what you do actually is that you, um, you, you optimize the, each variable um, at a time, right? Or 
each block of variables at a time. So, and hopefully the the hope would be that these these um, these these um, optimization problems here are of course simpler to solve or hopefully with closed form solution um, than than the original problem, of course. Right? And and um, ADMM uh, was it, it was designed right towards um, to, to to for a class of convex problems, right? To to tackle convex problems. Um, and but the problems that we have, they are non-convex, right? So what we actually do is that we need to we we also need to prove, for example, the convergence of of the algorithm and and everything. But again, um, these are in the paper. Uh, if you wanna discuss more the details later, I'm, I'm happy to do so. So yeah, enough of ADMM. Uh, yeah, of course, the, the slides of my talk about ADMM, they are on, on, online on GitHub. Uh, feel free also to take a look if you want. So, so now let's talk about some experimental results with those models that I showed uh, involving the student T. Let's see whether, whether we can get better graphs or, or not. So basically this is uh, on the left, Hand side here we see we see that plot that I showed before, which is uh, using a Gaussian assumption, right? Using the algorithm by Jao, 2019, and um, I considered in this in this case it was seven years of data from January 2014 to December 2020, um, and these uh, seven sectors of the SP 500. So on the left on the right hand side you see the proposed um, the proposed the output of the proposed algorithm, right, which is which is based on a student T assumption, and we can see that um, the graph looks a lot more cleaner, right? There are many less um, spurious connections between nodes. There are there are a lot more connections within their within the within stocks between their um, within their own sector, right? And the modularity index is also is also um, twice as much as the one with the Gaussian assumption. So it actually, um, it, it's actually a lot more helpful to just use a student T, um, a student T assumption than, than the Gaussian one in this particular case. Now, for the k-component case, we run, um, we run also our algorithm, and then we can see that um, our algorithm, first of all, avoids the fact that um, there were isolated nodes, right, as compared to the algorithm of Kumar 2020. And uh, on top of that, we can see that the structure within each sector is much more finer, which makes a lot more sense, right? We wouldn't expect, for example, uh, that many connections between stocks. Uh, we would expect a much more sparse, um, a much more sparse structure, right? Um, and so this this is um, four years of data from from January 2014 to January 2018. And we can see that it's um, it's vis visually um, clearly better uh, our proposed algorithm as compared to the to the state of the art. Now um, I would like to to show this these little experiments with, uh, that I did with um, foreign exchange data, which is currency currency data. So basically, it's the 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 price of a currency over time, right, uh, with respect to another currency. In this case, I took the U.S. dollar as the, as the reference, and then. Um, and then I construct, I estimate the networks uh, of this um, of this data set um, with both the state of the art algorithms and with our algorithm. And we can also uh, we can also verify the same thing, right? On the left hand side here, we have the Gaussian um, the Gaussian assumption, and yeah, we can see, for example, um, <clears throat> um, the connections between the currencies in Australia, Australia and New Zealand, which is very obvious, right? That's that's something you expect. Or, or or some other some other pairs of countries there that are there are like uh, kind of like for example China here and Hong Kong and so on. So but but also we can see a lot of connections that may not may not even be true or maybe like just uh, complicating things in the network. Uh, whereas the student T case is much more uh, is much more cleaner. I would say. Uh, things make a lot more sense. Like you, I can clearly see, for example, this the connection here between uh, I guess this is uh, Taiwan and South Korea, um, Sweden and and, uh, and Norway and so on, Australia and New Zealand again. 
Um, so, yeah, it, we, 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 we can easily conclude that um, the student T graph, even though, even though the, the optimization problem is a, is a lot more complicated to solve, um, at the end of the day, it's, it's a better estimation of the network. And now some additional results with, with foreign exchange now involving uh, K component graphs from, from different methods. Again, Kumar 2020, uh, this, this other method here, NI uh, 2016, and our proposed method. And um, yeah, again, we can see that, okay, adding, K com adding um, rank constraints, it, it def definitely help to like clean up the network. We can see that even though this is Gaussian, both of them, both A and B are, are from a Gaussian, Gaussian assumption, they both um, they both look a lot more cleaner than the in the connected case, right? Um, however, when when there is this big these clusters that are like uh, there are that, that that have contain more um, contain more currencies contain more nodes, they get messy within them, right? For example, this this one here is it's a bit um, it's a bit messy here. Whereas in in whereas in the student T case, um, everything is is a lot more cleaner. And also, uh, we can objectively tell also by the modularity index that that this this network is possibly much more representative of the actual reality uh, than 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 those two on the left. So um, to to wrap up, right? We in this talk, hopefully, I motivated. Um, I give you reasons uh, why the Laplacian matrix is a good model for. For, uh, for the precision matrix of financial instruments. And, um, and I showed that um, the per performance of in real, in real data scenarios is, is, is much better uh, when you consider, for example, degree constraints and, and heavy tail assumptions. And um, if you wanna see more, um, there, there is a lot more, a lot more results in the paper. Um, so if you are curious about these, um, Take a look at the at the archive paper, um, and yeah, to just to conclude, I would like to to go back to my fluxogram here. So we've we've um, we've finished this this block here, and now uh, I would say the next thing is to is to look back again to, into financial data and try to to understand it better uh, or try to explore um, other stylized facts possibly that that people have not um, taken into account yet. And then hopefully we can um, we can get even better even better methods, um, yeah. And um, thank you very much for um, listening to me. And um, I'm happy to to answer um, any questions that you may have. And I would like to say uh, this is this is kind of sorry. Um, the the code is already on GitHub. Um, I'm gonna update. I'm gonna update the link here, um, and possibly so when I post the talk online, it's gonna have the the updated link. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much.